Today we have just one announcement and is that we will continue having interlock studies on Sundays at 9 a.m. And so that will carry on. And the only thing if you're not aware of is that the prayer week, uh, midweek prayer on Wednesdays, it's going to have a hold for uh, some weeks until we come back again from summer and all the traveling that most of us are doing during this period. So uh, we will let you know about this change whenever it comes back again. From that, we are going to put this time in prayer so the Lord will help us to meditate in his word. We have Wendell today sharing with us the word of God. Uh, we have Mike and Trisha and the family uh, traveling in Waukesha in Wisconsin. So we can also have them in our prayers as they come back and finish all the different errands that they have until they, they're done with the things that they have with their house as well. So let's pray. Dear God in heaven, we are so grateful to have you as our Lord. Thank you once again because we have the immense privilege to worship you and honor you with our lives, with our lips, to also learn more from you. Thanks for your word. Thank you for bringing holy and holy man who wants to serve you and wants to provide as well word for, for your for your people, Lord. And I ask that you will help us to keep our minds focused in what you want to teach us and anything that is driving us away in anxiety uh, concerning or anything that is away from this moment, just help us to remain in your word and learn more about, from you, Lord. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who is in here and is helping us to understand and remember the things that you are teaching us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. At the beginning of 22, my wife and I stepped back into Rock Harbor, a community that we had helped plant, that I pastored for many years. And after being away for a season, we came back in with fresh eyes to a church like so many churches, like, like every church that was in a rebuilding process. And there was a significant amount of disconnection and disorientation and trying to figure out, well, who's in now to take this thing forward? And one of the things we brought in was a new passion for tables. In my work with Alpha and some of the house church gatherings that we had been hosting, we realized the space of the table could be a significant foundation to build on. And so we began to dream with the team about what would it look like, in addition to Sunday mornings, to really focus on table moments. And the crazy idea was birthed of a thousand table moments for the sake of bringing Rock Harbor back together, but also extending church to people that were desperate for it, but honestly probably carried a lot of skepticism and questions about it. Uh, my friend Gavin, who was on our team, took the lead and the thousand table build out began. Our vision was just sharing life together. Really simple. Sharing life together and there were three components that are part of a table. First is a meal, second was sharing stories, and the third was prayer. Uh, and that was meant to be something that could just be an entry level for just about anyone. And that's something that we just saw God show up time and time again because people felt like they could step into this because we eat meals every single day. And so what we asked our community to do was just be more intentional at that time in that space and invite others into that and see what God can do. One of the beautiful things we began to see is that it didn't just stay inside Rock Harbor. It began to grow and expand as people reached out to their neighbors, their coworkers, their families, and others who don't belong to our community who need the love of Jesus. And the table just happened to be the vehicle for that. And so we began to hear countless stories of people encountering the love of Jesus through the table in their businesses, in their neighborhoods, through their soccer teams and baseball teams and, and people that they just see on a daily basis as they go about their lives. And it was really beautiful to just see how the Lord blessed this in our community, but also used it to really expand our community and grow beyond Rock Harbor. One great story of how Tables was extended beyond just people gathering in a home was, was one of the business leaders of our church, who happens to be an elder, was at a business meeting that he was hosting, a business dinner. And he said it wasn't going well, it was a bit awkward, and he was even frustrated. And then he had this, this sense of, what if we made this a table? And he began to share the vision with these, these secular business leaders of 
our church bringing community back to this space and begin to ask some intentional questions. And he said, in almost no time, what was this sort of awkward, stilted meeting became an honest confessional <laughs> between leaders of what was happening in their lives and questions and passions they were carrying. There were tears in the eyes of some of these business leaders. And that is a beautiful story of how uh, Jesus can show up at any table when we create space. We began to just see this organic movement outward where something that began for our community specifically, uh, the Lord blessed and began to move outward and inviting other people to encounter Jesus as well. And there were a number of different stories that we heard. And, and one of the most profound one was a friend of ours, Carly, who gathered a group of moms together and even neighbors and others. And she just had this beautiful transformative experience that the table was the center of. I just felt this nudge of figure out what it looks like in your season to be Jesus to the people around you. So for me, I have young kids. There's a ton of young kids in our neighborhood. Um, why not just invite them all over? It's the perfect um, way in my space and season to connect with the people around me. So sent out these invites, got past those fears, invited some friends over and um, neighbors over, a lot of people who didn't know each other. So a lot of fears surrounding that. So I just decided to order a bunch of breakfast burritos and put out mimosas and just texted people. We're having mimosas and breakfast burritos at this time, you know, feel free to stop by and um, had a huge turnout. I think there are 14 moms, 18 kids. It was a blast. It was so fun. And I think there's so much depth um, to be gained in relationship from a table and sitting side by side and sharing a meal with someone and having that intentional time. Um, I think there is just so much value and depth to be gained around a table in ways that can't necessarily be met in the same way on a Sunday or at a church service. Sundays are important, but we need to increasingly create spaces for people to explore Jesus and be welcomed into community beyond church buildings and church services. But at the end of the day, the end zone was culture. We just began to see a culture that had largely been about sitting in seats and, and watching a few people use their gifts uh, shift towards what does it look like to, to take church beyond the walls of Sunday? And what does it look like to put church in the hands of people um, around tables? And, and that really is the ministry of Jesus. You know, there have been uh, great theologians that have remarked that most of Jesus' best work happened on the way to tables, at tables, or leaving tables. And we certainly got to experience the power of table. And it's time for the people of Jesus to reclaim the space of the table, to invite a world in that is carrying more questions about church maybe than ever before, but is desperately longing to find a family to pursue more with. And we were grateful for the gift of the table to discover that. Wasn't that great? And what does it look to turn the church ministry up in front to the people in the pews that go and invite people into their homes for a meal or a barbecue out in the garage or someplace? You know what I'm saying? Um, that video, I thought, absolutely follows along with the uh, videos we've been watching every Sunday. Um, so in um, 2009, 2009, 20 pastors in the Denver area got together, 20 pastors, uh, to see how they could help their community. And guess what they did? They invited the local mayor of their community to come to their meeting. And uh, so they discussed how these churches could help their community. What do you think were some of the uh, issues that came up? What were some of the issues of problems or areas that could be helped by these churches? Anybody have an idea? Any community, what, what problems do they face? Poverty, homelessness, absolutely. Not knowing your neighbor. What about kids? At risk kids. Uh, what about loneliness? Elderly shut-ins. I mean, the list goes on and on that they were looking at. 
Now listen to what the mayor told that group of 20 pastors. This is what he said, quote, the majority of the issues that our community is facing would be eliminated or drastically reduced if we could just figure out a way to become a community. What do you think he said? A community of great neighbors. End of quote. In a word, the mayor invited a room full of pastors to actually encourage their people to again begin obeying Jesus. And he reminded the pastors that quite frankly, actual relationships always trump government programs in solving social problems. You know, um, being a good neighbor almost sounds like something biblical. I wonder where you could find that in the Bible. <laughs> so let's uh, let's read. But when let's read together. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Amen? So let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this time together. We've heard your word. And we ask your Holy Spirit to take it and apply it to our own lives. Thank you for each person's here, those who are watching via live stream. Uh, encourage us, I pray this day. In Jesus' name, amen. So are you ready for a Bible story? <laughs> The last few weeks, we've been watching each Sunday a uh, different video. Here we go. I wonder what this Bible study is going to be, a Bible story is going to be on. <clears throat> a teacher of the law came up and tried to uh, trap Jesus. Teacher, he asked. What must I do to receive eternal life? Jesus answered him, What do the scriptures say? How do you interpret them? The man answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. You are right, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. The teacher of the law then asked Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Jesus answered him by telling him this parable. Uh, there was once a man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Robbers attacked him, took his robes, beat him up, leaving him half dead. It so happened that a priest was going down from Jericho, down that road. But when he saw the man, he walked by on the other side. A Levite arrived next, went down, looked at the man, and then walked on by on the other side. Then a Samaritan who was traveling that way arrived on the scene. When he saw him, he heard he, uh, his heart was filled with compity. He went over to him, poured oil and wine on the wounds and bandaged him. Then he put the man on his own animal, took him to an inn 
where he took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins, gave them to the innkeeper. Take care of him, he told the innkeeper. And when he, when I come back this way, I will pay you whatever you spend on him. Jesus concluded, in your opinion, which one of these three acted like a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the robbers? The teacher of the law answered, the one who was kind to him. Jesus replied, go and do the same. The last few weeks, uh, we've been um, watching uh, each Sunday a different video from a book called The Art of Neighboring by Jay and Dave. In fact, those, those authors, Dave and Jay, were the guys speaking on the video each Sunday. And obviously one of the resources for this message. So what is the strategy and purpose of those videos and this message today and the message to follow? Got two more coming up. It's simply to prepare the ground for planting a seed. I wonder what the seed is. Remember the parable of the sower? Some seed fell on the path, the hard path. Some fell on good, good ground. I wonder <clears throat> which ground that this is going to fall on today. <laughs> Speaking of preparing the ground, has anybody here ever used a hoe to weed uh, uh, <laughs> to, to weed out the weeds in your vegetable garden? Anybody? Anybody use a hoe? <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. How about this? Has anybody ever driven a farm tractor? Well, good. We've got a few hands up. <laughs> uh, it wasn't this baby, though. I can tell you that. This is the world's largest tractor. Now look at the semi. Look at the size of the tractor in comparison to the semi. 135,000 pounds that tractor weighs. Had a 1,100 uh, Detroit diesel motor, motor in it. Pulls an 80 foot wide cultivator, plow. Can you believe this? It can cultivate 1.3 acres every minute at 8 miles an hour. It's a big boy. <laughs> Actually, both the hoe and the tractor are metaphors for how we can approach becoming friends with our neighbors. Sometimes the gentle, the gentle way is best. Sometimes you need a little bit of uh, boldness. Both are needed sometimes. And sometimes it starts just with baby steps. Here's an example of that. Let me tell you the, past, the story of Pastor Randy Freeze. Moved to, da to Fort Worth, Texas to pastor a church. And you know, when we go into a new area to buy a house, we always have a list of things we want. A certain number of bedrooms, bathrooms, a certain size master bath, you know, the kitchen, you know. They had none of those. None of that was on the sheet of requirements. All they were looking for was a neighborhood that already had a couple of people from their church living in it. That was all that counted. And a couple of people from their church that was willing to work with them doing these baby steps. They found a neighborhood with a couple of couples in it from their church, bought a house, whatever house, didn't matter. And here's what they did. They began walking around their neighborhood with their other friends people from their church, every single afternoon, evening. So there were six of them walking around, week, day after day, and talking with whatever neighbors happened to be out at the time. And that soon, you know, consistency counts for something. Pretty soon it wasn't six. Pretty soon it was 12 people were walking. Pretty soon it was 20. Pretty soon it was 30. Pretty soon they brought the barbecue out from the backyard into the front yard, into the driveway. All the neighbors came around, barbecue. Pretty soon uh, they began looking, the neighbors, as they walked around, what, what lawn needed mowed, what house needed painted, whatever. And they began the neighborhood, helping in their neighborhood. Um, 
in the end, every single house in their community is reached for the Lord except for two people, two houses. That was it. The beginning step might just be to, be to, to, to greet your neighbor, get to know your neighbor across the fence. Um, let's see, did we get uh, the, these papers passed out? If not, let's do them now. Uh, this is a paper we're going to pass out. It might be just a hand, uh, a, a help to you. So you're in the middle, and you've got neighbors around you, more or less. Some of you do, some of you don't. Do you even know their names? So number A is where you put their names on there. And uh, then we start with that. Just know the names of your neighbors, you know. Then as you get to know your neighbors a little bit better, number B is, do you know anything about your neighbors that you wouldn't just see by looking where they drive a red car, but you get it from actually having talked to them? And then number C is something deeper that you've really had some good conversations with your neighbors that go way below the surface. And so this is just a help that you can take this home, work on it. Um, Karen, a couple of weeks ago, did a great, uh, um, after one of the videos, told her experience of slowly getting to know the neighbors that lived right around her in an area that she'd been in for whatever, 20, 30 years, you know. And uh, so you start, you start maybe a little embarrassing uh, living in a neighborhood, not knowing your neighbors, but you start somewhere, you know. Thanks, RJ. You see, there's a progression from becoming, from being a stranger in your neighborhood to becoming acquaintance to becoming friends. There's a progression. It's a journey. And um, sometimes you develop friends that we already mentioned about bringing the barbecue grill from the back where we always have it in the backyard. What's wrong with bringing it to the front driveway? You see there, friends around the barbecue. And that's where friendships are born. And that's where that video we just saw this morning, the thousand tables, that is where this fits in to begin inviting um, neighbors or friends or anybody, enemies, <laughs> uh, to around your table. To uh, And remember the three things that was mentioned in the video? You begin with a meal, and Bob's a meal. It begins in sharing stories, and it, begin, and it ends with prayer. Stories, you know, ask your neighbor what, what job or where he grew up and they ask you and so you share stories of your life with each other. Thousand tables that church had. It wasn't all in one row, mind you, you know, table at a time. Something we can think about. Another step might be to have a block party. Anybody ever have a block party? No, no, no. Oh, good, 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 good. Um, so where I lived in uh, Sanford, when I lived in Sanford, where I lived, we had a block parties in our block well, once or twice a year. It was a regular thing. And I was part of the block that helped plan it and organize it. It was a wonderful time. Tables would all come out, and these people were from a lot of the Caribbean and Central America and from all over. I mean, the food was incredible. And they'd put up the canopy shades, you know, and just had a great time. The police always came. They always wanted to help themselves to the food, you know. <laughs> it was wonderful food. Wonderful time of uh, just getting to know your neighbors on an on a easy way to do it. Let me tell you about the first time it ever happened. One of our leaders' neighbors was sort of the leading uh, organizer of this block party. He was from the Bahamas. And uh, at the end, when we were all winding down, guess what this neighbor did? From the Bahamas, i got to remind you, you know, their customs were a little different than mine. I would never do what he did. What he did is he get all the neighbors together, get her in a big circle. It's probably 60 of us. And hold hands, a big circle holding hands. Who would ever do that? And guess what he turned to me and asked me to pray for the neighborhood. 
It was almost like I was elevated at that moment to be block chaplain. <laughs> and it was out of that experience that there were other Christians in that block that we began to, oh, you're a Christian. And we begin to have a Bible study. And you will not believe, now that was like 10 years ago, you will not believe what happened this morning at 8 o'clock. This morning, one of those neighbors has a son just graduated from college. He's going on to graduate school. He wanted to be baptized. And we have another uh, college kid that wanted to be baptized. So at 8 o'clock this morning, we were over at Waikiva, Waikiva Springs. We went in, and I had a baptismal service this morning of those two, two uh, college kids. Can you believe it? And the seed was sown uh, 10 years ago, at least, when uh, we started having a block party. And today, had a baptismal service out there. Incredible. So uh, what about um, so what about time and effort? Uh, here's the thing: talking to your neighbors across the fence, inviting them over for a barbecue or block party, all takes time and effort. And most of us already have more on our plate than we can chew. So most of us don't have the time or energy to talk to our neighbors, to have a barbecue or to have a block party. But obviously, none of those things are going to happen by themselves. We have to be intentional. We have to expend time and energy. We have to allow ourselves to be interruptible. <laughs> I love that word. In our daily routines to allow space for that unexpected encounter with our neighbor. It's called building margin into our lives and our calendars. And I'm one of the world's worst. Jeff is sitting right back there in the back of the church. And he's tried to get me time after time after time to get together with him. It hasn't happened yet, but it's going to happen, Jeff. Because why is it happen? Why is it not happen? I, haven't, I don't have margins in my life. It's just too jammed up. I worked all day yesterday. I've got to work all day tomorrow. And it's just that's, that's the way it is in my life. No margins. So the question is, how are we going to live like Jesus? It's, um, the answer is, we must keep the main thing the main thing. And to love our neighbors as ourselves was not a suggestion. It was a main thing. So what about fear? Another barrier to getting to know our neighbors might be fear of the unknown or fear of the neighbors you already know. <laughs> One of the uh, videos that we saw just a couple of weeks ago touched on this very issue, fear. Now, there's two amazing stories in the Old Testament that are linked together, but separated by 40 years, and they have to do with fear. The first was the story of the 12 spies who went to spy out the promised land before they went in and possessed this promised land. Now remember, 10 of those 12 spies were, came back uh, and they said there were giants in the land. There's no way they could conquer them. They were afraid of them. Let me read a couple verses out of Numbers chapter 30, 13. Then the, quote, then the men who had gone up with them said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And we saw ourselves as like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. End of quote. Was that true or was that false? The ten spies had an absolutely false perception of reality. How do I know this? Forty years later, Joshua spent two, sent two spies into Jericho to spy it out before they went in. And this is what they found out. Now listen, Joshua chapter 2, 9 to 11. Just compare what I'm reading to what you just heard in Numbers chapter 13. So I'm quoting. And Rahab said to the men, I know that the Lord 
has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Shihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. End of quote. Do you see the connection? Forty years separated, but these, but the, but the ten spies had seen giants, but they didn't know that they were giants whose heart had melted. That there was no spirit left in any of them, because they had already heard about God drawing up the Red Sea, and the destruction of the two kings. The ten spies saw themselves as grasshoppers. But they did not know that those giants that they were looking at saw themselves also as, as grasshoppers before the God of Israel. Isn't it true that so often the things we fear don't really have anything to do with reality? The picture of the world's greatest, largest tractor is sort of a metaphor of the power of the Holy Spirit in our own lives to to plow the land and possess our neighborhood. So what about obnoxious neighbors? Uh, when you first meet your neighbors, everything appears normal. The grass is cut, the fields are paid, the kids are fed. <laughs> but as time goes on, you get to know your neighbors. And you begin to learn what is really going, under the, going on under the surface. And it's entirely possible that you will encounter emotionally wounded neighbors or neighbors whose dogs barked all night <clears throat> or neighbors who seem to have a pharmaceutical side business out of their house. Behind every door is a story. And remember, that there's always more going on than what meets the eye, even in your own house, may I say. <laughs> Do you remember the poster that Trisha put up, uh, I think it was just last week, when we did the video, about the differences between two and four? Being responsible, two people is healthy. Two people is healthy. It means that we are responsible to love them to encourage them, to bless them, to pray for them, to serve them. But being responsible for people, being responsible for people is unhealthy. In this case, it means we mistakenly take responsibility for their well-being, for their finances, for their happiness, for their success or failure, for their spiritual progress, for the strength of their marriage, and so on and so on and so on. We are responsible to bless, pray, and help them. But we are not responsible for the outcomes. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan. He did not bring the beaten man back to his own house. Didn't cancel his plans for his own trip. Didn't drastically arrange his schedule. The Good Samaritan was willing to be inconvenienced but he did not allow the event to change his entire life. Even Jesus did not heal everybody. Even Jesus has set boundaries with the people that he encountered. So what about focus? To neighbor well, you must learn to narrow your focus. You, can't be friend you can be friendly to everybody, you, but you can't be uh, what we would be called good friends with, with everybody. And by focusing in, it allows you to have impact. Um, so the question is, how do you discern the people that uh, you want to become good friends in your neighborhood that you can have an impact on? Remember when Jesus sent out the 72? Uh, he 
uh, told them to be uh, to go to find a person that was a person of peace, which would indicate a person of, that was prone to hospitality. And a person who's prone to hospitality is a person who has a large network of friends. That's the people we need to find. Can you think of somebody in your own neighborhood that's a person of hospitality? Well, it's a good place to start. Partner with them for the good of your neighborhood. So what about arterial, arterial and versus ultimate? A couple words. So let me end this message with both a word of warning and a word of encouragement. Being good neighbors is not an evangelism strategy. And if evangelism is your only motive, then you won't be very good neighbors. There's a difference between ulterior versus ultimate. Ulterior means something is intentionally kept concealed. The ulterior motive is being a good neighbor must never be to share the gospel. But the ultimate motive is to share the gospel. There's a difference. And its impact on our lives. It's tempting to offer friendships with strings attached. But we don't love our neighbors to convert them. We love our neighbors because we ourselves are converted. Jesus never called us to use a bait-and-switch approach. The great commandment says to love our neighbors, period. That's where it ended. No other expectations given. Thus, good neighboring is an end in itself. But here's the beauty of being a good neighbor. As you understand what's going on under the surface with your neighbors and the pain and the heartache that might be there, over time, you can share with them the pain and heartache in your own lives and how God has intervened, done a work in your own life, areas of struggle and pain. And it's out of that witness across the table, across the fence, on the block party, it's a witness that you can share your testimony and the gospel can be shared. So to start with, let's fill out the paper. Take it home, fill it out as best you can. And um, then ask yourself, who are the two or three neighbors in my community that I relate with, that relate with me, that connect with me, who are people of peace and hospitality? And as you identify them, then those are the people, Frank, frankly, you need to begin investing time with and becoming friends with. Um, when the time comes for us to reach heaven's glory, uh, we all want to hear the expression, uh, welcome, good and faithful servant who loved your neighbor as yourself. And so that's what I'm praying today, that we would love our neighbors as ourselves. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time together, for the parable of the Good Samaritan that reaches down through the centuries and touches ourselves. Help us to be good neighbors to even the neighbors that live right around us. And uh, thank you for this group. Uh, this is a loving group, a group that reaches out. But just help us to be maybe a little bit more intentional in the people that actually live around us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.